Thank you. All right. And we have had uh, people from all around the world, like Japan, Russia, India, as well join in. So I just want to make sure you're not coming from abroad, but that's so cool if you are. <laughs> and then is it uh, Elvira? Is it is that correct? Elvira? Yeah. You look familiar, Elvira. We have seen you here before, but welcome back. <laughs> but they've now opened it. See, it took uh, a while. Good morning. Yep. Okay, we can. Um, sorry. Oh, we can hear you now. Sorry, I think you're unmuting and muting. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was not sure that if I, I am to continue or not. <laughs> nice. Are you also coming in from the San Jose area, or? Oh, I think we lost you. Are you in America? Uh, we are in Sunnyvale, California, um, in the U.S. Are you uh, <laughs> from abroad as well? Is it Samuel? In the U.K., but it took a while I, for you guys to come on because it said 210. I, I used to be in Mountain View. I was visiting. Uh, I was on visit back in 2020 in Mountain View, and that's how actually I was I found uh, the, the, your club and I was um, and in fact I found uh, several clubs and now I effectively am a member of speak on I always forget sorry one of the uh, Toastmasters in Campbell and now I'm a, a, your guest as well I do enjoy your meetings every every time <laughs> I am uh, attending your meeting so thank you for having me back to you thank you Avira. and are you coming in from abroad you said now so before you're visiting mountain view and then now are you somewhere else or well yeah i i am uh so i i was living in new zealand before and i actually was introduced to toastmasters back in new zealand and then i traveled it was in the u.s in mountain view area and now i'm in russia it's a long story oh my gosh so you're very international um you have international presence over here that's a i think that's a big story you have to tell yeah uh, I know I get invitations from Toastmaster clubs all over the world, like Hong Kong and, and different countries <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all right, and then Samuel, or did you want to briefly just uh, tell us what brings you in or a little bit about yourself? I'm a Christian and I go to church. And um, I um, seem to love Toastmasters. Nice, appreciate it. You... Topics and that, but I wanted to know um, which country you're in. Yeah, we're in the U.S. Um, yeah, what part of the U.S.? Uh, California, as a state. Oh, yeah. And Sunnyville is a, is where we're based out of. But everybody here is from a, maybe a different part of town. Yeah, like a Facebook messenger for this California um, Toastmasters. Yeah, we are on Facebook. Uh, we're under startup. Yeah, can you put the um, link in the. Um... Mm -hmm chat please i will do we can add you to our newsletter as well so just private chat me your email address um i don't i, I prefer not to i just want the um link to the facebook so i could message the speech bubble if that's fine messenger you got it will do all right so before we introduce the toastmaster of the day and who's also selected a topic the, uh, the tension of justice and mercy. And she definitely has either an invocation or will elect somebody to do an invocation on this topic um, about what motivated her, inspired her to choose this topic. But Zaina is a new, uh, one of our newest club members here. Uh, Zaina is a software consultant uh, for Oracle and NetSuite based out of Santa Monica. She does uh, give a lot of advice, feedback, um, a lot of information and detail to different kind of business leaders in our industry. So communication is key and essential to her career development. So um, that's one of the th reasons why it really just pushed her to become part of this Toastmasters club and Toastmasters in general. So please give a round of applause to Zaina. So Zaina, our Toastmaster of the day. Hello everybody, Toastmasters, honored guests. I'm excited to be your Toastmaster for today. For our invocation today, I'd like to start off with a quote from Lance B. Wickman. 
that mortality is a battlefield upon which justice and mercy meet. This is something I've been thinking about a lot, this tension between following rules, between being merciful, understanding that humans can change while also not allowing them to get away with things that don't encourage them to change. It's something that we can't really get away from, whether you're a parent of a child trying to understand how to reinforce what's going on in your household, a lawmaker in your local community, or a leader inside of your international community. It's necessary that we find this tension and that we engage with it. We are able to come up with some sort of mixture between justice and mercy as we engage with our world. So I challenge you today and throughout the week to really look at the moments that you have the opportunity to choose some mixture of justice and mercy and to make sure you're choosing intentionally between them. They don't just allow whatever you did last time or whatever the people around you are doing to make that decision for you. And today, I hope we have a fantastic Toastmasters meeting. I'm certain that we will. And I would like to, oh, I'd like to pull up my list here so that I can see what happens next. Um, and now I would like to go ahead and call on our duty masters just to make sure that everybody is still feeling comfortable in their role today. Right now I have Haroon as our awe counter, Waiming as our timer, um, Haroon as our word master, Jose as the grammarian, Hannah as the ballot counter, and Haroon as the video master. Haroon, would you like to describe what it is you do as an awe counter? Well, thank you, Zaina, and good morning, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests. As Toastmaster, uh, I'm sorry, as, as an awe counter, I will be counting the number of ahs, ums, any repeated words that you do, uh, that you use when you are speaking. And at the end of the machine, at the end of the meeting, I will report back on how we did on ahs and ums. And, and this is just to be a check on you to encourage you to stop using these fellow words so that uh, your speaking becomes more effective. Thank you. Madam Toastmaster. Wonderful. Thank you, Haroon. Well, I mean, would you like to describe what it is you do as a timer for today? Uh, yes, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, most welcome guests. My function today is to run the, the time that you see in one of the squares in the grid view. And I just want to confirm the speaker's time. For speaker number one, Georgie, is it five to seven minutes or a different amount of time? Well, I'm going to assume yes, it's five it to seven is, minutes. It is five to seven minutes. Thank you. At five minutes, the green light will come on, six minutes, the yellow, and then the seven minute, the, the red light, and the speaker has 30 seconds to finish. The second speech is also five to seven minutes. And then with the evaluation is two to three minutes, table topics, one to two minutes, I'll report the time at the end of the meeting, Ms. Toastmaster. Wonderful, thank you, Wai Ming. Haroon is our word master for today. What is our word? So in keeping with the team of the meeting today, our word of the day is going to be contradiction. Contradiction means an act or instance of contradicting, a proposition, statement, or phrase that asserts or implies both the truth and the falsity of something. So for example, Thomas Hobbes said, both parts of a contradiction cannot possibly be true. A statement or phrase whose parts contradict each other. A round square is a contradiction in terms. I'll have the, so that's going to be our uh, word of the day, and I will post the uh, the word of the day and, and its meanings and examples in our uh, uh, in our chat window. Madam Toastmaster. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Arun. Now I would like to pass it off to Jose, who will be our grammarian for today. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. I will be grammarian this morning, and as grammarian, I will help you in pointing out certain aspects of your speech that maybe you would like to improve, such as the other uh, way we use our words, uh, tense, numbers, contradictions in our words. And also, if you come up with, if you uh, express yourself in some uh, artistic and uh, significant manner, I will also say that. And I will make that report towards the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Jose. We really appreciate that contribution. And then Hannah, 
Can you tell us about the ballot counter position that you'll be holding today? Most, uh, yes, <laughs> most yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Semester, and I will be uh, counting out ballots uh, at, towards the end of the meeting. So you'll be voting for the best speaker, best evaluator, best table topics master towards the end of the meeting. Um, and we'll be awarding and announcing, um, giving a round of applause um, to the winners of the, today's meeting. So that'll be towards the end of the meeting. You will get a Google Drive link. We'll be able to vote for these categories. Fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Georgie, who's a longtime member of our club, always has interesting things to teach me every time she comes up to talk. Georgie today is going to be talking about disruptive investing for five to seven minutes. Please give a round of applause to welcome her onto the stage. Um, I'm going to need a second to get set up. I'm going to need the screen, so I need to share. Today we're going to talk more about investing and we're going to talk a bit about different investing beliefs that people have. For instance, many people, especially small investors, are told that Wall Street is a place for experts. It's driven mostly by large investors with fancy algorithms, but even the large investors with their fancy algorithms can't really seem to beat the market. So what is a small investor to do? The best advice people give is just put your money into a mutual fund or an ETF that tracks a benchmark like the S&P 500, basically suggesting that you should follow the crowd. Well, that might be some good advice, but there's also other investing advice that is also contradictory to that advice, and that's to invest as a contrarian defined by Merriam-Webster, it basically it says that you should be buying when others are selling and you should sell when others are buying. So if the standard thing that most people are doing is doing something like buying into the S&P 500 indexes, what should you be buying as a contrarian? Well, one way to be a contrarian is to be a stock picker, but that takes an awful lot of time. Students so said you can look for other investment houses that are actively picking stock and maybe invest with some of their ETFs. For example, one of the most interesting out there is from a company called ARK Invest. And they have five different ETFs. They started out in the industry with their first one called the ARK Innovation ETF. Its ticker symbol is ARKK. And basically it invests in lots of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, blockchain, DNA, next-gen internet, fintech, and all sorts of innovation around automation, manufacturing, and energy. This ARC Invest, was this company was started by Catherine Woods. She's been doing stock picking for over 40 years. The official name, ARC, supposedly in their documentation comes from the acronym Active Research and Knowledge. In actuality, Catherine Woods is a devout Christian and the name actually comes from Ark of the Covenant. One might say that's a bit of a contradiction as well. The one thing that's very interesting though is the Wall Street Journal has quoted her as not just being one of today's hottest fund managers, but maybe one of the hottest performers of all time. Once again, an interesting contradiction. So how does ARC manage to be so different? Basically they invest in disruption. This is a quote on the screen from Kathy Woods. Essentially what she's saying is that when you're talking about disruption, especially disruption that will completely transform an industry, it's very difficult for traditional investment analysts to understand how this huge change is going to change a market. 
because they can't really envision the size of the opportunity, they aren't able to analyze the disruption or understand how exactly that's going to make huge differences in the amount of money flowing in and out. For example, Tesla is considered an innovative company, but many people look at Tesla and think they make cars. So then they compare Tesla to Ford, which is another company that makes cars. As you can see, by looking at traditional analyst numbers, revenue, incomes, number of autos produced, looking between Ford and Tesla, there's no comparison. Ford looks like the clear winner. Their revenues are so much higher, so is their income. They make in the cars in the number of millions, where Tesla only makes a few hundred thousand. But if you look at the market cap, what the market thinks that the company is worth, Tesla far outshines Ford by over 10 to one as far as market cap goes. So what's going on? Well, if you look at Tesla the way ARC looks at Tesla, Ford is a car company. It makes cars. Tesla is a company that makes a car-shaped robot that is capable of using machine learning to self-drive and get over-the-air updates so that it's constantly being updated. They use innovative manufacturing techniques to keep prices down, including breakthroughs in battery technology and energy so that these car-shaped robots are actually uh, clean tech and using renewable resources. The other thing that ARC does that it's very different from other investment companies is that they are radically transparent. What do I mean by this? Usually if you do invest in a mutual fund that does active stock picking, you don't know exactly what stocks are in your mutual fund except maybe once every three months. And then at that snapshot in time, the fund will put out a list of the stocks they've invested in and the percentage of the money going into each individual stock. That's great for a once a month snapshot. In the case of ARC, however, they are totally transparent. They put out a list every day on the internet for exactly what the fund is investing in that day. There is a whole cottage industry of video bloggers on YouTube that do nothing but check what is Kathy Wood and her team investing in today. And how is that changed from what happened yesterday and the day before? It's actually rather astonishing that this one investor has now created this whole other industry around her investments. The other thing is the company itself is incredibly open source with how they evaluate companies. Usually financial analysts want to kind of guard their models, how they evaluate companies and keep that kind of to themselves. That's their secret sauce. In the case of ARC, however, they often could uh, put together a evaluation model of companies and then post it to their GitHub repository. So you can download it and figure out exactly how they came to the concept of what they think it is. For example, on the screen, there is one that they have put out for Tesla and they're constantly updating the one for Tesla, for example, but you can find out more out there. What is this resulted in? Well, this is the a comparison of the ARK, A-R-K-K Innovation Fund, the first one they put out, to the uh, NASDAQ. And you can see the NASDAQ's the yellow line. The blue line is the ARK ETF. And you can see that over the last five years, they have just blown through their results. On top of that, I mean, the NASDAQ itself was doing pretty well, but ARC has completely blown them away. The result, Kathy has gotten tons of praise, especially on boards like Wall Street Bets. She's often referred to as Aunt Kathy, Queen Kathy. Her latest nickname from Japanese investors is Money Tree. In summary, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily invest in ARC. Like I said, you can check out their listing of every stock that they invest in in their fund and maybe just decide to do it on your own. But I think more importantly, since we just had International Women's Day go by, 
I think the point that you have someone like Kathy Woods, who kind of came up, developed her own industry in the industry, and then completely surpassed what was expected of her just by being innovative and disruptive is something that we can all learn from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgie, for that speech. Everyone, if you could take a moment to private chat Georgie a little bit of feedback, that would be fantastic. And Winding, if you could get yourself set up during that time as well. I'll give you another like 30 seconds or so to wrap up thoughts for Georgie here. All right, I'd like you all to put your hands together to welcome Wai Ming. His topic today is Medwar Zone. I have to admit, I've been very curious about what it is you're going to tell us about this. It's not something I've heard about. Why Ming, like Georgie, always brings in stories and ideas that I have never heard of before. And it would be a contradiction to say that I don't enjoy listening to what he has to say. So Why Ming, without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Ms. Toastmaster. It is not a contradiction to, to look at this. And, and, and by the way, I didn't know about this until a few weeks ago. So <laughs> it's always interesting. So the problem, the thing that we're gonna be talking about is if you solve the right problem, you can achieve great success. And so this is just a way of looking at this idea of solving the right problem, achieving success. So there is this concept of the Medawar Zone, which is uh, published in an article by Craig Lowy in 1990. And he was referring to this guy, Peter Wadawa, who was a Nobel Prize winner from the UK, and who was considered the father of organ transplants. And he, after he invented all that, he got a Nobel Prize, he wrote a bunch of books. And one of the books is called The Art of the Soluble, which is talking about the, the greatness of science, how, how, it, how interesting it could be, and, and so forth. And, and in there, he hinted at this idea, but Craig Lowy actually talked about it, is that if you want to solve difficult, there are, there are different types of problems uh, in terms of difficulty. And, and if you solve those difficult problems, sometimes it could have great payoff, but only in certain circumstances. So that's the idea. And so, so it's like this. On the right-hand side, if the problem is so difficult, that you always run into a brick wall. You never solve it, and therefore there's no payoff. On the left-hand side, if the problem is so easy that anyone can solve it, then there's not much value in that. So it's more in the middle where the problems are really potentially very hard, but it's solvable. And, and, and therefore, if you solve those problems and they're actually useful, then it could be very valuable. And this applies to science, applies to startups, and we're in startup speakers, and, and in many other types of endeavor. And the idea is how do you find those problems say, right in the middle and how do you actually solve those problems? I won't be able to address the, the how to solve the problem. How do you even find the problem in the middle is considered an art. Because frankly, you don't know what the problem is really hard. It's sometimes you just don't know until after you solve it that it's solvable. So it's that type of thing. So I'm going to give one example, and then I'll hint at other examples about this. Complicated chart. There are two rows of stuff. I'm going to talk about the bottom one, reusable space rockets with SpaceX. The whole idea of day rocket was essentially started around 1926 by Robert Goldrick when he 
put a supersonic engine with a liquid fuel rocket and actually shot, shot it up and it was successful. And then since then, many countries have tried and especially Germany in the 1930s when they invented all these V rockets and, and other people follow suit with Russia and, and certainly the US and many other countries over the last few years because they're essentially a military race. If whoever gets the best rockets can dominate the world. That was the idea and, and Germany was demonstrating it in the 1930s. So that's, that's the idea. And, and, and nowadays people use those rockets to go into space. And, and, and since 19, the 50s, people have gone into space, gone to the moon, gone to different places, and, and, and it was very expensive. When Elon Musk looked at this problem around 2000, the year 2000, he was looking at the problem of how do you make it cheap, make it cheap to go up into space? And so this idea of the reusable space rocket comes back, comes in. Yeah, it's like how do you actually, you know they're gonna make it cheap, you have to bring it back down and reuse it and, and therefore you save a lot of money and so on. To, to actually solve that problem, you need a lot of things. You need to have rocket engines uh, invented already. You need to have sensor and GPS. All those systems just came about in the 1980s, especially computers and control systems and all that stuff. And without that, no one could have solved the reusable space rocket problem. And Elon Musk picked that problem at the right time, around 2000, and he spent the next 20 years to make it successful. In fact, the Falcon 9, one of the Falcon 9 rocket was able to go up nine times and come back successful. And so that's the point. On the top, I talked about something called photoacoustic imaging. I'm not gonna go into detail. Found the phenomenon founded by Alexander Graham Bell, and it never came into something that's fruition. They could actually see the brain, the, uh, the, uh, the blood vessels in the brain until just recently. So it took a long time and it depended on a number of different things that had happened before that. So the idea is in order to, to you have to really pick the right problem to, to, to then solve it. So to put it in the context of the metal war zone, SpaceX in 2001 with the reusable rocket was in that zone. We're looking backwards, that's why we can sort of we, we didn't know whether it was solvable, but that, that's the idea. And Elon Musk was able to see that. And, and that was the value he brought. Whereas uh, for the acoustic imaging, most of it was not. And so, so now though, in 2021, in 2021, for the acoustic imaging is becoming uh, more solvable. And, and frankly, there are other things that are on the horizon and many other ones that are not listed here that could be in the zone today, but we don't know until a few years afterwards. So the point is the problems that can be solved that can have great payoff changes over time. And how do you get into the zone? You have to pick the right problem. And in some, a lot of that is you just need to know a lot of stuff or know a lot of people and can collaborate to go after that. And then you have to use the right tools. And then you have hit the right timing to pick the right problem and you solve it, then you have great payoff, like what SpaceX and other people have done. Ms. Toastmaster. Thank you so much, Wyming. Everyone, take a couple of minutes, or take a minute, I guess, to give Wyming some feedback privately in the chat. And we will convene to get our general evaluator and the evaluations going. And I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to wrap up thoughts for Wei Ming here. Mm -hmm. 
All right, fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and pass off our baton to our general evaluator, who today is Gautam. Thank you, Gautam. Hey, good morning, fellow Toastmasters. I'm our honorable chief guest. Um, thank you, Toastmasters. So we'll be evaluating our speakers today. Uh, we have our two speakers with a wonderful topics and very good insights from disruptive investing to metaverse zone. Let's welcome our first evaluator, Hannah, who will be evaluating our speaker, Georgie, on the topic disruptive investing. Hannah? Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. My apologies, I was just typing something in the chat, but we are moving to the evaluation portion and then that'll be followed by the table topics. So uh, Georgie, uh, you gave a speech uh, very similarly to your previous speeches on financial, I wanted to say financial awareness in general. Uh, for some people, their financial knowledge is very high and for some people it's kind of low. So I felt like your speech today was a little bit at a higher level um, that most people would expect, but it was also very informative. So you did speak on destructive investing um, and also tied it into more innovation and um, innovative investing, especially tying your, your speech back to um, Queen Kathy or Catherine Woods um, and speaking about uh, kind of her impact in this area. So your content of your speech, you did start uh, with going over the etymology of this ARC concept. Um, for me, I almost thought of Noah's Ark, but you did also uh, tie it into um, kind of more of its history and its background and what she intended that word to be. Um, and then you also went over some of the analysis of their holdings. Um, you made some assumptions. So with people's financial background, you talked about open sourcing uh, and then just circled back to kind of her background and, and her impact in this area. So I would say overall content wise, um, it was a little bit at a high level, but I was able to easily understand the flow of your speech. You're very clear as a speaker um, in general. You're, you, I felt like you had the interest of your audience, the awareness of your audience, your clarity was high, your eye contact, um, I think is a struggle for everybody. I also on Zoom struggle with eye contact where you're supposed to see the camera and not like yourself, um, but I always drift my eyes back to seeing yourself. So I think um, eye contact you still maintain. Gestures were high, you use a lot of gestures in your speech was, uh, and you felt comfortable. I didn't feel like it was unnatural for you to use gestures. So I think you did that very well. Um, and then your topic was also very relevant, especially here for Silicon, Silicon Valley, right? Investing, I feel a lot of people are always talking about investing um, and or there's also a lot of different meetups um, on investing like Volatility Club and different kind of educational uh, places. So I almost feel like you're going in that direction, Georgie. So I fully support you if that's the, the way that you wanna go um, as well as uh, possibly pursuing your series seven licensing, right? So like I can see you doing both of those two things um, if that is something in your future. Um, in terms of pros, I would say once again, clarity, your speech. Um, you also added a little bit of humor um, in regards to uh, uh, Kathy or Queen Kathy. Um, you, I would say one thing um, overall I would like to see is just keeping it simple. I feel like there's this access to knowledge in, on investing and it's not really accessible to many communities. So the more we can simplify sometimes this kind of information, it just makes it accessible to a different kind of communities um, that we may interact with. And that's just in general versus more of I would say more technical communities that you may be a part of. So I do feel like you do very well in this kind of area. Um, I would like to see you more uh, pursue more speeches. Also, and I know my Zoom background is a little bit casual today as well. I would just say that if you are going to deliver the speech, maybe in a more professional setting, um, maybe just working on lighting. So my Zoom background today is very casual as well, but just working on your lighting and your background um, of your area. But thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Hannah, for the wonderful evaluation. Let's welcome our next evaluator, who is Jose. We'll be evaluating our uh, speaker Weiming on the topic Metaverse Zone. Let's welcome Jose. Thank you. Thank you, uh, our general evaluator. Yes, uh, this is a continuing uh, series, it looks like for Weiming, wherein he presented another aspect of the development of the technology. And I was looking forward to his speech. He started off the speech with basically problem solving, right? How to, how to do problem solving in terms of developing technology. And he always covered other topics of this matter. But in this, in this topic, I wasn't very clear as far as uh, starting off what the draw was. So I, I didn't catch the draw uh, in the beginning. It, he did present the problem a little bit, 
maybe a little bit more draw when you when you say it, um, make it more interesting. As far as the the the, the delivery, I like the delivery. I understood everything. It seems that there's enough inflection to his voice. I'll, maybe a little bit more inflection, um, a little bit more gesture. Uh, looking at the looking at the the screen and uh, oh, oh, on key points to uh, uh, when he whenever he has key points with on his speech, that will be good. And I, I think that will uh, may uh, attract the the audience more. And then towards the end, he did say a few things in terms of his summary, in terms of um, how to come up with, with something innovative. And I think that's the one draw of the speech in that, it, it, yes, it is a challenge, but maybe a little bit more examples on other people who actually done it. I think it would be beneficial to expand on that a little bit more, maybe a few more examples. So overall, I would say in summary, um, a little bit draw in the in the beginning, maybe uh, uh, something beneficial for the audience, for example, and this speech will help you uh, be more innovative. And towards the end, uh, he he mentioned a few key things, for example, he said, there's, if you're very artistic, uh, pick the right time and know a lot of research and a lot of people, maybe uh, emphasize those or maybe Mention that towards the end, uh, and as that as those are the the key key drawback, uh, what things that you could draw from your speech, and if you emphasize those, I think uh, overall the speech will come out very very uh, convincing and uh, interest interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Thanks for the evaluation. Uh, let's go back to our uh, table topics and uh, giving the control over to Georgie. Thank you very much, Gautam. Hey, today's topic is on the concept of justice and mercy. Let's see. So we're gonna try to go through some aspects of this kind of broad philosophical idea. So don't worry if we don't get to, to too much depth because you can only do so much in a minute or so. The idea behind table topics is that we're kind of practicing what happens as maybe maybe as an entrepreneur, you're in an elevator meeting with someone and one of your potential investors asks you a really weird off the wall question and you kind of have to answer it in an intelligent way, just sort of randomly. So this is really good practice for doing that. So let's start off with uh, maybe just some basic definitions um, so I looked up justice. A basic definition of justice is just behavior or treatment. Now, mercy, on the other hand, has a bit more of a, a broad definition. So why don't I ask someone, why don't you give us what you think is a definition of mercy? And just remember, our word of the day is contradiction. So would anyone like to volunteer to tell us what they think of when they think of mercy? And otherwise I can ask someone. So why don't I ask Zaina, since this was kind of her topic, what is your definition of mercy? Mercy, so I think one of the best examples I've had of mercy is there was experience when I was little where I was sitting in front of the television trying to you know, really focus on Scooby-Doo and um, a woman came by me with a vacuum and she was vacuuming up the room. And I remember having this moment in time where I was just like, stop, what are you doing? I'm trying to watch the television, you know, four-year-old Zena exploding here. And my mom comes out and she's like, Zena, this is absolutely unacceptable. And there are a variety of things that my mom could have done in that moment in time. My mom could have grounded me. She could have put me in timeout. She could have like taken toys. There, there are a variety of like appropriate punishments for, for such an outrageous claim of a four-year-old trying to stop somebody from doing their actual job for the sake of Scooby-Doo. But instead, my mom, my mom had me go apologize and told me that this kind of behavior is never acceptable. 
and that I should allow the woman I was yelling at to decide, you know, what, what, what should happen after that. And the woman decided to show me mercy. She said, you know, I believe that you can do better next time. So we're not going to put you in timeout and we're not going to take any toys from you, but I trust that you're going to get better after this experience. And I have to say, never again did I, did I get upset at somebody doing their job, not, not knowingly at least. And I think it was really effective. So for me, mercy is a means by which we allow people space to find improvement inside of their lives. We allow them to acknowledge what has happened to them, why that thing happened, and then to grow and move on from there. Because if we just follow the rules, it's possible I would have tried to skirt the rules. It's possible I would have tried to change the rules. And instead, I learned how to embrace those rules and find a way that it made sense in my life. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. For our next question, let's see. All right. I'll bring up the concept that one of the old definitions of justice coming back from the Bible was an eye for an eye. And obviously people then mentioned, then you have the concept of then all the world will be blind. So the concept, another definition of mercy might be uh, mercy is the wisdom and courage not to exact justice when it would create continued or additional harm. Can you show uh, an example or uh, are there ways that you think that we have forgotten to show and live the way of mercy in our, in our lives, in our culture? And why do you think this might have happened? Does anyone want to volunteer? I'll go for, I'll go for that one. Okay. Go ahead. So, so thank you, Madam Table Topic Master. I took a class called Creative Mind. And one of the book we have to read was called, a book called Derek Jensen by Walking, Walking on Water. So one of the chapter in here is you have choices. So one of the things that kind of surprised me is that even people who committed crime, they have choices. Yeah, they made a bad choices, but they still had choices. You know, we're human and human always have choices and depends on what kind of choices you make. That's what's going to determine. So let's talk about justice. So there's a retribution. So let me, let me, let me go this way. Like the previous uh, table topic talk, talk about, there's a thing called common sense. Now, common sense means that you want to do the th right thing, but sometimes when you do the right thing or the, the correct thing, you don't become creative. In order to be creative, you have to think out of the box. So I'm not advocating murder or anything, but let's just assume if you never touch a hot stove, would you ever learn that hot stove is hot? So sometimes some people make the choice not because they all bad because they made a choice because they didn't know better and then they learned from it. So when it comes to justice, it's just kind of hard to determine. And maybe he made the choices that, so I guess the question here is, is choice made by human or is choice just a random thing? So you have to think about that. Thank you, Madam Table Topic Master. Thank you. Okay, all right. We know over time the concept of what is just varies and it also varies from culture to culture. Has there been a time when you maybe traveled or talked to someone of a different generation and you were struck by a, their very, a very different concept of what they consider just and merciful? And would you like to share it with the rest of the group? Go ahead, Elvira. Thank you, Georgie. <clears throat> it's a very interesting question for me because I have traveled and lived in three different countries. And my original culture is actually Asian one. I was born in Kazakhstan, which is a very Asian country. And the concept of mercy and justice, in some way, it is very universal to many people, but in other ways, like toward women, for instance, 
is not the same in some ways. And I could feel it, especially in New Zealand, because in New Zealand is a very, let's say, feminine country in, in a way that it protects women's life, women's rights. And I could feel that, for instance. So I was born in Kazakhstan and lived there for 16 years. It was enough to form some habits, <laughs> some understanding what you are in the world. I was so different in New Zealand when I realized that I am more human. <laughs> I feel more human. I mean, more respected in this society other than, uh, than in, in, the, in the country I was born in. So in this way, it's like in my in the country I was born in was okay. It was just enough to, for instance, do lots of not fair things toward women, like be, uh, let's, let's say, doing three jobs, going to work, looking after children, and also all the chores. It was normal, I like it, but in New Zealand, it's not. Everything is actually quite, quite uh, fair to uh, for both genders. So in this way, I, I think it's a good contradictive at the same time, good example of how justice in mercy works is something in Kazakhstan, back in Kazakhstan, it's not just for, for women, for instance, have a love affair. <laughs> she is very, uh, she's judged for, for doing this, where this man can get away with it. In other parts of the world, it's almost, pretty much the same. I mean, it's almost, always uh, it's the same. It's not, not good for both gens. Back to you, thank you, <laughs> Georgia. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. So um, a quote from Pope Francis is that mercy and justice must go together, but sometimes it can be difficult when we are, we find something we find very unjust to show mercy. So what are some of the things that make it difficult to be merciful, especially maybe in daily interactions with other people, coworkers, friends, or family. Can you provide some sort of example of something like this that you may have experienced or seen? Any volunteers? Wa Ming. Ms. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, most welcome guests examples of mercy that I see in daily lives. Well, there are a lot of competition, especially you work inside a company, people compete with each other because you know they either get higher salary or they, they get to get their job and other people get laid off. All types of things happen. And so competition happens all the time. At the same time, people do form friendships and, and with the friendship, they can then you know, help each other and so on. And, and in, in that sense, and there's no contradiction that there might not be much mercy inside a corporation because inside a corporation, people compete with each other, except for the friends. If you're inside the friend cluster, then maybe you survive and, and so on. So <laughs> it, it's sort of like very, animalistic and and that's where it goes at the same time there are sometimes that people do open doors for other people to go through as as long as the door gets into doesn't get you into the wrong place and all that stuff so that's the only thing i could say miss toastmaster okay thank you very much Wami. kind of touching on the idea of corporations and the administration of justice and mercy. The platforms, Facebook, Twitter, a few others, even Clubhouse have become places where people are using freedom of expression. And at the same time, this is a international platform. So once again, 
justice, mercy, all of this varies from place to place and what things are allowed to be spoken about and what things aren't. Does it, in your mind, make sense that these platforms are not only just gatekeepers on discussions, but they're also in a way having to corporatize justice and mercy. Does anyone have an opinion on this, which hopefully won't get too far into politics if you don't mind? Anybody interested? Let's see. Uh, Gautam, have you had a chance to respond to anything? Thank you, uh, Table Topics Master. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I'm not, I didn't understand the question correctly, okay. but if I hear that uh, from my perspective, how justice and mercy differ from a corporate perspective, uh, uh, of course, uh, they are using this as a platform to empathize with the people. But from my perspective, they are how they are using this. They are doing a contract contradictory with the, the real meaning of mercy. And um, let me put the, put it this way: when the pandemic hit, everyone took that opportunity to to show their to embrace how they support their employees. However, there are many companies they want to take a profit out of this. That's purely from a business perspective, but I see that as a as a humanity uh, to support people, to uh, to encourage them, to motivate them in the pandemic here. I see the same when everyone is celebrating Women's Day. That of course they are celebrating their employees, but indirectly they are promoting the companies. Why do I see an ad in a LinkedIn? Why do I see an ad in a Facebook? What's the point of posting an ad for celebrating their employee in, a, in a, the company? So does it mean that they are really celebrating or they are using that as a platform or an opportunity to promote their company? All I see is a humanity. I don't see that as a mercy or something. I see it as a humanity. He see a human. Yeah. We are, we are just human beings. Everyone has their own uh, life and things. And there are people who have contradictory statements uh, that will also considered as a humanity. That's what I see as a mercy. Thank you, Table Topics Master. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have some quotes on justice and mercy. So I'm going to read them out and then ask for a volunteer to tell us what they think the quote means to them. So this is one from G. K. Chesterton. For children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. Does anyone have any thoughts on the quote? Uh, Harun maybe? You muted. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Master. That's an interesting question where, in a sense, where as you grow up, as individuals grow up from being children to adults, I think the act of growing up is a sort of what I think what Mr. Chesterton was trying to imply was that the act of growing up is a form of corruption. And it, not to say that's corruption in a negative sense, is that you get cynical and you get a strange, you give yourself permission to, to transgress the limits that you, can, uh, that you can have. So the problem is that you know, when you are innocent, you do demand some sort of justice because that vindicates your position. However, as you grow older and you assume more positions of power, of influence over other people, then the expectation changes that you also provide uh, mercy to your peers so that, you know, if you do commit a transgression. So I think the, that difference between growing up sort of makes that uh, 
that clear that that there are certain nuances that you have to that you have to observe and you need to figure out where how that how do, where to apply mercy and justice so if you're innocent for your younger child fairness is an important that yeah you don't want to uh, differentiate between a siblings or friends or little children but among adults you do need to have some sort of mercy because somebody made a mistake Madam Table Topic Master. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, okay. uh, Hannah, have you had a question yet? I have not, uh, but I don't know if all of our guests have as well. So I think. Do any of the guests? Well, let me read out a quote and then people can tell me if they would like to respond to it. Let's see. Okay, this one is from Ansan Suki. The true measure of justice of a system is the amount of protection it guarantees to the weakest. Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Okay. Anna, what are your thoughts on this from a quote from Ansan Suki? And let's not get into the political aspects of it, please. I can read it again if you'd like. If you can, please. Sorry, I'm getting okay. a few messages in the chat, but. No problem. Mm -hmm. The true measure of the justice of a system is the amount of protection it guarantees to the weakest. So you prefer that I do get into politics or yes or no? <laughs> in theory, no, no. Okay. but we'll see. I saw no. <laughs> Um, but do remember that contradictory uh -huh. is the word of the day. In the spirit of remaining neutral and uh, away from contradiction or co becoming contradictory, uh, I will just say that I did hear a lot of the terminology of mercy be thrown around uh, during this top table topic where I feel as if uh, being, mer uh, get, being merciful or showing mercy or demonstrating mercy in any kind of situation is more of an obligation. Uh, versus really just thinking about a uh, word that's a little bit, I guess, uh, over in our society, we don't really think about it, but it's more grace. So we always go for, um, it's really just giving ourselves grace when we don't deserve it, right? Or other people when they don't deserve it. And so I feel like mercy is more of an obligation, like you're, um, you're obligated to be merciful in a situation versus giving the person grace. And that's, um, I, have the, I have listened to podcasts and I can't remember the gentleman's name and I feel like he's more into yoga and meditation. And there's a, a, a really a quote that he always says that stands out where, um, Besides empathy, like when we're talking about Brene Brown, and I can never pronounce her name properly as well as like giving people empathy, empathy and showing them empathy. It's also we've over, as a society, we kind of overlook giving people grace as well in, in this situation. So whether it's in our workplace or in our living situations or our family situations, um, and that's just like kind of like forgiveness when it's undeserved. Um, and it, that's, that's also something that we should be open to receiving. So um, it also is in the spirit of me reading this book a long time ago called uh, Grace Over Perfection. Um, where in a society, in our society, we are more perfection is driven versus giving grace. So instead of mercy, I would like to focus on grace. Thank you, Ms. Table Topics Master. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, perhaps. Table Topics. One more question. So. Yes, uh, please. Okay, so the quote that I was going to read is actually kind of touching on something that Hannah said. This is from Timothy Keller. Mercy and forgiveness must be free and unmerited to the wrongdoer. If the wrongdoer has to do something to merit it, then it isn't mercy. Do you agree or disagree or maybe have a different take on it? And let me know if you need me to read it again. What question is that? Uh, it's uh, it's basically a response to uh, what what your thoughts are in that quote, especially with respect to mercy and justice. About. I can I'll, I can give you another quote if you'd prefer. Yes, please. All right. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. From Francis Moreau. <laughs> The most terrible thing in the world is justice without mercy. Do you agree, disagree, have another thought on it? 
That's a hard question. It is a hard question. Do you, would you like another quote maybe then? Yeah. All right, this one's from Abraham Lincoln. I have always found that mercy bears richer fruit than strict justice. I don't know that one. Okay, well, let's, let's try this instead. This is more of an open-ended one. What does the word mercy mean to you? Um, the word mercy means to me um, to have faith in God and to put things according to his right um, achievement by reading his word and meditating on his word and sharing it with others instead of keeping it to yourself. And also being merciful with other people and being honest and truthful instead of telling lies to other people, knowing what you should do and knowing what you shouldn't do. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think everybody, maybe except for maybe not Jose, but everybody else got a question, I believe. Is that correct? Anybody else want a question otherwise? We... Okay, uh, why don't I now transition back to, I believe our general evaluator to evaluate the meeting, which would yep. be Gautam today. That's correct. Thank you, Table Topics Master. Um, we will be evaluate, we'll be going over into our uh, duty masters. Let's welcome our timer, Vaimi. Um, Vaimi. How did we perform today? Yes, Mr. General Evaluator, fellow Toastmaster, and most welcome guests. I'm going to read off the time. Georgie spoke for eight minutes and 41 seconds. I spoke for seven minutes. Uh, in the evaluation, Hannah 302, Jose 243. In the table topics, Zena 202, Dean 152, Elvira 228, myself 128, Gautam 206. Arun 144, Hana 141, and Samuel 40 seconds. That's the timer's report. Thank you, Remy. Um, let's have our grammarian for today, Jose, to give us- yes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. General Valier. Grammarian report. I just have a few uh, word choices uh, for wiping. Just, uh, I will hint on other examples. I didn't understand uh, what, what that meant, but just that, and there's a few uh, memorable phrases from Zanya, allow people space to move on with their life, right? So that was a very challenging phrase, phrase that makes you think. A pick at the right time was the key phrase for why me. Key phrases also, there is no mercy in corporate settings. So that, that was a very challenging, very interesting uh, phrase from why me. And also from, from Gautam a platform to empathize with people. That was very good, interesting, interesting uh, characterization of social media. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Let's have our word master today, and Harun, to give us a report of our word of the day's contradiction. contradiction. I always seem to forget that. Well, thank you, Mr. General Gallier. Uh the number of word people who use the word master was you did quite well. I, I heard Jose, Georgie, Waimeng, Elvira, Zaina, and I believe Hannah also uh, used it, but I don't have her listed uh, there. The rest I didn't catch, so if I missed anyone, I apologize. Thank you, Mr. General Validator. Thank you, Arun, for giving us the report of our word today. And do we have a joke master? Okay, yeah. Go ahead. So show me mercy in this particular joke because it costs someone his job. So don't cost me my job. The Tokyo Olympics got into lots of problems. Last year it was supposed to happen, but then because of COVID, it got delayed. And maybe it'll happen this year, we'll find out. 
However, it cost the, the guy who, who was supposed to run the Tokyo Olympic his job because he said something about women, which was not appropriate. And then just recently, it cost another guy his job. He's the creative chief for the Tokyo Olympic, Hiroshi Sasaki. He said he proposed something that cost his job. So I'm going to tell this. Hopefully it'll be funny, but don't cost me my job. <laughs> So he proposed the idea that of dropping someone from above a fashion icon in Japan. Her name is Naomi Watama, Watanabe. She is very rotund, rotund in size. She would be dressed in pink and she would come down and then he would call that Oli <laughs> Olympic. <laughs> You get it? <laughs> Which... <coughs> Olympic. Anyway, so that was the joke. <coughs> you got it or not. <laughs> I guess some people got it. Anyway, don't cost me my job though. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Remy. Let's uh, move, into, move back into our, uh, our counter report, uh, Haru. Could you give us a counter report today? You are muted. I'm trying to. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. For our counter, I counted two repeated words for Georgie, five from odds and arms for myself. Gautam, I counted four for you, when Hannah one, Jose five, and Elvira five. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. So um, let's give us a, the final evaluation of how we do perform today from a general evaluated perspective. Yeah, we started on time and we took a few minutes to fill the roles. Other than that, uh, we were on the track. On table topics, it seems like uh, we were out of time, but uh, I understand the, the importance of table topics. However, I do notice some of the the evaluation or the feedback, um, especially when we give someone feedback about how, how could they improve. I would like to see that as giving an example rather than it could be improved or a little bit could be an improvement. So instead of saying more generic, uh, it would be helpful for the speakers and the respective uh, recipient to provide, if you could provide some examples, like how a person could improve or rephrase uh, his or her words. So overall, the meeting went well. Uh, I'm very excited to see the next one. Let's give the control back to our Hannah. Thank you, Gadam. And I think I'm just missing a couple of votes um, from, from Dean and Sam, but if you have submitted already, thank you. But I will post the link one more time. All right, and then we might be able to circle back to that one. But I think if we want to fill roles for next week or have guests um, also give your closing comments on what you felt about the meeting before we announce the winners. Oh, Dean, are you still with us? Yes, I am, sorry. I just, I was muted. I was doing the, um, the link also. Yeah, I thought the meeting was very. I thought the meeting was very well, and I like. I I saw I had to drop off for a while, so I didn't really hear the speech. But I thought the table topic was one of the more more thought provoking one. Usually, when I go to Toastmaster, the table topic is kind of like easy. So this one really made you think. So yeah, and thank you. Thank you for your feedback. And then thank you, Georgie, for also putting that together this morning. All right. What about Elvira or Sam or Samuel? Uh, thank you, Hannah, for giving me the opportunity to speak. So uh, um, I feel really thankful for having or for introducing to your club because the topic of your club speak up as mentioned when me actually I did connect only today <laughs> why I like the topics of your 
Beaches, kids, it's actually the name of the club that speaks about it, the startup topic. And I, I, I do enjoy every every meeting. Prob now as a guest, probably I'm thinking of joining the club as well. <laughs> I love really <laughs> uh, the, the things uh, going on in the club. And probably one thing I would add because the topics are very interesting to me, I probably miss a bit connection with personal stories in the speeches. So the topic is interesting, but I, I can't connect it with myself. I mean, how I can do this in my real life, everyday life, those things. So that probably is a great thing to add as well. Thank you. Back to you, Hannah. And thank you for that feedback over and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you more soon and then definitely keep in touch with us. And I know for us, it's a startup club. So it's like supposed to be early morning, but what time is it out there where you are? <laughs> uh, oh, for me, it is five now AM. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> You're way up earlier than we are. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. More power to you. That's amazing, Gavira. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. No, no, I need to probably make it clear. Now it is half past six p.m. now, but the morning club, uh, the, the evening for you, the normal, I mean, evening meetings mm -hmm. happened to, happen to me uh, when I, uh, in my time zone, when it is 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's still awesome. All right. And uh, do we have Samuel or Sam? Hi. Hi. Sam, if you, if you just want to share like a, a, um, just a little bit of feedback before we announce the winners of today's meeting. Okay. It was quite good this term's masters. But I wanted to know what time it starts every every week. So it's uh, seven ten in Pacific Standard Time for the U.S. But I know um, in entering letting people in on Zoom, so sometimes that may take a minute or two. So, oh, so for me, definitely just get logged in. Yeah. It will be two ten. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two ten every week for me on the Thursday. Yeah, mm -hmm. is it? Is it? You said 2.10 p.m. Uh, out in the UK. Is that the time for you? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Okay, so Thanks. the Zoom link is where? In the chat, please. If and Georgie, that, you had something to say? Uh -huh. Yeah. If the any of the guests would like to get more information about the club or Toastmasters, I can send them something. If they send me their email address via the chat, that'd be great. And just send it directly to me if you'd like more info. Awesome, Georgie. Let me check up on this ballot to make sure. All right. While you're date. doing that, why don't mm -hmm. I make certain that the members know that today at six o'clock, we have the area competition. This involves the international speech competition, and the table topics. And yes, I realize this is very last minute, but then again, it was only really organized. We only found out about it on Sunday which in Silicon Valley is considered <laughs> not that late, considering the way we pull things together. So you had tons of time to get everything together. I know that uh, Zaina has mentioned some interest in taking part as a table topics contestant. I've sent out emails and notices on WhatsApp about more people wanting to maybe volunteer. I haven't seen anything back, but this is kind of the last minute to do this. Does anybody have any interest in be, uh, being a contestant either for the table topics or for the international speech competitions? Kind of speak now or forever hold your peace type of thing. Sorry, tomorrow at six? Today at six. No, no, <laughs> tomorrow. What's all that about? No, uh, today at six. It's, it should actually be in the on the WhatsApp as well. I'm looking for the email that came in from our, our person, our, um, our 
area director or governor, wherever they're calling themselves now. And I cannot seem to find it. I'm looking and looking and looking, but it is today at six o'clock and I will do my best to find it and send it via our chat. So first, before any anything else, does anybody besides Zaina have any interest in becoming a contestant for today for the the competition today? I have the Facebook for this um, thing you're saying. I'm I'm sorry, I don't I didn't understand what you're saying. Can you repeat it? And I have the Facebook for this meeting that you're on about. Yeah, we I'm looking for the. Uh, not Facebook, the, um, I think it's on Zoom. A Wufu, Wufu uh, sign up that they want us to go through, and then also the Zoom link. I'm not wanting to use the WhatsApp, I'm wanting to um, do it on Messenger. Okay, I don't know if they have that available. We didn't set it up, it's set up our area governor. And for the life of me, I cannot. I will not be able to come at 6 p.m. tonight. I have another event. Yeah, I understand. I got the same kind of situation. Okay, does anybody else have any interest in becoming a contestant? Because uh, our area six governor. Tonight. Pardon me? I come at six o'clock tonight. Well, you, you might be able to attend as a guest. Are you a member of Toastmasters? Um, I just seem to join Toastmasters. Okay. We, uh, the Toastmasters is split into different areas and districts. Our club is located in area two, and today is the competition for the area two area. So I think you might need to be registered as a member. Is it the same, is it the same Zoom link? Probably. Or could I have um, a different oh, Zoom wait, link? wait, wait, wait. It, it is not the Zoom link that we are currently on. It's a different Zoom link. Yeah, can I have the Zoom link, please? I don't, I'm looking for it, I can't find it. So, but um, like I said, this is not for, this is a competition for members of the Toastmasters Club. I was able to chat it, I think that's the right one. So just let me know. Did you, did you find it? I think Thank so, yeah, God. I chatted it in this. Mm -hmm. I cannot find mine. Okay, so that mm -hmm. is the sign up form to, uh, for it. And that also, I think, has some instructions on how to get to the Zoom link. Maybe not. No, it doesn't. There is no Zoom link. I, on think, it. I think you have to register to get the Zoom link. That's usually how it goes. Probably. Probably. Okay. So, am I, am I clear in understanding nobody wants to take part in the competition today, this time around? Nobody at all. I do. Well, I think you need to be a member first. <laughs> Any yeah. members I, want to take place? Come on, guys. At least one person. Oh, and they are going to need some judges as well. I think they're going to need some of us to be judges. And you need to have some speeches behind you in order to do that. I have a competition. I have a, another meeting at six. Um, I mean, I'm, my meeting's going to run over at six. Yeah, I've so. got one at five as well. This press. Yeah not supposed to end until 6 30. Yeah. this thing uh starts at six and is, is in theory scheduled to eight thirty till eight thirty. so um all right i guess we're i guess you can go just put me down but i don't know if i qualify i don't know if i can do the tabletop. Qualify. you can do, do tabletop or are you talking about judge or okay. what no i don't want to be a judge why don't, you, a why don't you sign up on wufu and and that okay. way Vera, our area governor, will figure out where he should go. So if you want to be a contestant on that or something, table I, topic. I'll try. You don't I'll, need try. To be... I'll try. Pardon me. Table topic. You don't need to be. You don't have to do any speeches. It's international. You have to do a few speeches. Yes, <laughs> but I still think this is the competition, and and they still want. It's not just for anybody to sign. It's it's for table topics members. I have the Zoom link, please, when you're ready. Okay, well, the link that uh, Hannah sent out uh, will let you register and I, she thinks that it's going to allow you to, I haven't checked it, will allow you to um, get the Zoom link. Do you see the link um, for Wufu in, from Hannah in the chat? I, I, I'm saying I can't use Wufu because you've got to pay. 
for blue food, isn't it? No, this one's free. It just tells them that you're registering to just go to the competition. Where Where is the blue food? It's in the chat. Hannah sent it out to everyone. I, I can't right, see and then We can, um, yeah, I, I sent it to you direct and then I think to everybody, but we can go and resend that to you. But in the spirit of getting the meetings because we're a little bit over time. Yes. Um, let's go and just announce the winners here. Uh, but let's give a big round of applause uh, for best table topics master, best table topics master. Oh, I don't know if she left, but it was Elvira. <laughs> Well, congratulations, Elvira. Uh, best evaluated this morning. It was a tie between me and Jose. So me and Jose, congratulations um, on best evaluator for this morning and best speaker. It was also a very fierce, uh, almost a tie, but give a drum roll and a round of applause to Georgie. So very fierce competition between Wyoming and Georgie. Um, Georgie won it by one vote. So congratulations, Georgie. <laughs> All right. So thank you guys. We'll take a quick picture. And then I know in the next meeting, uh, we'll be able to do a little more things since we're over time, but everybody smile. All right, great. Thank you. And then we'll send that Wufu link one more time so you guys can